Welcome back to the new podcast. Uh, today we've got Hillary and Audrey, our um, heads of engineering, product development, and program management for the new one charging systems. These are the two ladies running these development programs and manufacturing. Uh, and today we're talking about unit two, the future, units three and four, manufacturing, bill of materials, but um, what were the improvements from unit one, which was our proof of concept in the market, to unit two, and where we're going from here? And we're already looking at significant cost reductions, even in like partnerships, component selection, right? On like the power electronics side. Yeah, and I mean, inverters. just in con consolidation. So as we make improvements, we're bringing just the total quantity of parts down significantly. So yeah, I just, it, we were talking uh, in the board meeting on Friday, or sorry, not Friday, yesterday. Oh, wow. um, but then also a couple of weeks ago, and they were asking what the bomb cost was. And I, I had relayed a higher number than what we're at today. I think we were like roughly 30% higher ish before. And that's what I relayed. Um, they should be happy with this update. They'll be happy with the update. <laughs> but then they asked the question. And the only things I can come up with is we don't contract manufacture. We don't license a lot of the technology that's in there. There are other, there are like component suppliers. So vertical integration, the, the thing that everybody usually thinks of when they say that is like, okay, you make your PCBs, you make your plastics, you make all that stuff. And I'm a big fan of doing that when it makes the most sense. But there's also like you, you know, have somebody make a part that they're best at making, right? And then bring that part in and do final assembly in-house, which a lot of which companies try doing. to avoid that, yep. right? They they're avoiding doing the manufacturing, the final assembly in house. Yeah, they because the thought process is that it's less capital investment, less expensive, and much safer from a risk management standpoint to have a contract manufacturer like build your product. But having done that myself, like gone out and outsourced that stuff, you actually you spend the same amount of energy plus additional energy and cost teaching them how to do it, managing it, making sure that it's because you're, right. yeah, because you're yeah. always, you know, every, regardless of anyone's claims, every single supplier manufacturer that's out there, they're going to do the very best they can to ensure it's high quality. But there's also like a significant portion that will ship it until you figure it out that something's wrong. Because yeah, if yeah. there's something wrong, it's their cost. They lose money off of that. Right. And if you somehow like accept a bad part and it works, well, you know, that's kind of the mindset of a lot of suppliers. I would say part of the the advantage of doing it in house, at least at this early stage, has been sort of the team cohesion that we got from the end of the quarter. I think with all of us working together, it felt like a huge team win and it brought people together. So that's something that is tangible but not measurable necessarily that I think translates into kind of the greater growth of a company and being able to work together with those people at on the ground point, is super yeah. important. At some point it will be measurable though, right? Your team understands how to build it. They understood what's wrong. When you, when you contract out, it's sort of like, well, here's my intention. And then somebody else has to go solve that. Yeah. And no one's really an expert. When you contract out, no one really becomes the expert in the product, right? Yeah. It's always kind of, Yeah a half measure. So when there is a problem, I think it's going to take 10 times longer to resolve it. Yeah. Because yeah, nobody really owns it at that point. It's kind of shared. That makes so, it complicated. Yeah, I mean, think about like unit one, which was the first one we deployed. That was very intentionally a, like, let's get a concept product out that we can prove that we can generate revenue and it works. And like people are interested in using it. And we did that twice before we did the first deployment because we did the we did a demo day earlier in the year last year and then like the official launch right in september yep but think about how much time you spent after that or before september 28th i think when we launched it right yeah and then after that like making improvements getting it to work before you guys did the second unit right and we started producing that and now you're on three and four and then we're going to continue from there so that's all knowledge that you wouldn't get if you contract manufacture that out. Someone else is going to yeah. become an expert in the pieces that you care about. And then your ability to reduce costs, create efficiencies and things like that is sort of lost mm -hmm. in there. Yeah. And I, I, I think of when we were putting those, well, Danny, 
was pulling all those cables <laughs> into a uh, gutter that was way low mm-hmm. and realizing, mm-hmm. oh, actually, for ease of manufacturing, the next time we're going to have to raise this up. Mm-hmm. To your point, mm-hmm. we now own that. We wouldn't have learned that had we. It's all not simple done that. stuff. Yes, yeah. Yeah. they would have like, or they would come back with a change request, right? And, yep. and you try to understand why, and then you're like, oh, and mm-hmm. it, it creates. I mean, how long did it take you to make that decision? Pretty instant. Minutes. Once we saw <laughs> yeah. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I think some of that, just being there and witnessing some of the struggles when you're building your first unit, yeah, it's super valuable and making quick decisions. Yeah, right. And we could also say here's some things that we need going forward. I can think of a number of changes that we quickly asked for from the admin IOT folks, like, hey, we need this so that we can see during our test session this piece of information that had we outsourced it, we would never have known. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're yeah. just, the, it's, the, it's the speed or the lack of sort of, it's the lack of, barriers right to make mm-hmm. a decision and make a change that is the most one of the most appealing things of doing it in-house and vertical integration and things like that the the other side of it though is you don't have all of the expertise to do all of the different things right like right now you guys are we have somebody else doing the the pre-build of the structure container the rack systems like all that stuff or part of those systems anyways we're not experts in that we could hire and build a team to do that, but we it actually makes more sense for us to move to the next generation and leverage someone else's expertise mm-hmm. in doing that mm-hmm. for the time period while we focus on where we know we want to go, which might be somewhat in-house, right, or not in-house. So yeah. there are benefits to doing that where we don't, that it's faster to have someone else like mold apart, machine apart, form apart, produce a PCB yeah. than it is for us to like, build all that up, build the infrastructure internally, hire the people to do it, make sure they're doing a good job. Yeah, I think my goal, though, is, to your point, to push the technology forward. And some of the repetitive tasks, like welding in a frame to a container, right. is not doing that. So it's best to outsource. Yeah, that's not something that yeah. like we need to have from a core standpoint. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, which, I guess, like gets to today's topic, right, which is kind of unit two. Um Mm-hmm. But everything that we learned from Unit 1 was applied to Unit 2. And then everything that we learned there, right, is going to go into 3 and 4 and 5, 6, 7, 12, 20, 30. Hopefully we're doing, like, pedestals and we're doing hundreds of those in the next couple of years. Um, that'll be the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I, I, something that just comes to mind very quickly as we think about going from Unit 1 to Unit 2, the biggest learning that I'm taking away right now with Unit 2 is the user interfacing with our product we saw that with unit one, um, but we were there to kind of handhold a lot. And now we're, we're partly because we've moved it, shifted yeah. the location, but also I think we're now trusting the customer more that they understand what they're supposed to be doing mm-hmm. and being able to look and see, are they doing what we think they want that we think that they should be doing and taking that learning. And then we're going to apply it to three, four and beyond. Mm-hmm. That seems to be the biggest thing that I'm focused on right now as I watch our users use Unit 2. <laughs> yes, and yeah. we have a Mark difference of opinion. Have, yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. Well, I I mean, from my perspective, we don't... It, ha, if I look at the market in general, most systems are designed like gas pumps today. Big screens, big instructions, stickers everywhere, disclaimers everywhere. Um, and... I would argue that most individuals that use a gas pump, even in the first time, they probably don't read all of that stuff. They just, like, inherently, it's very intuitive how it works, right? It's like, okay, I, like, plug this thing in. I put my card in. I, I click the 25 menu options right before I can actually pay and go forward, which you should never do. So I sense, Mark, that you have some difference of opinion about screens, stickers, and yeah, we've instructions talked endlessly <laughs> yeah. about screen stickers and everything else. I do. I mean, begrudgingly, we're going to have to put a screen of some kind on the pedestal to facilitate the touchless pay mm-hmm. option. Basically, like that's the one thing that I'm looking at in terms of where it is. But I, I firmly believe that 
the ultimate goal is the least number of steps possible. Mm -hmm. So just plugging in and having it work and then we do a transaction on the back end should be the absolute goal. Um, now it's challenging because we don't own the vehicle. Right. The vehicle makers need to buy into for plug and charge. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, there's only one company that owns the vehicle, right? And they, mm -hmm. they do that fairly seamlessly. And then the other one is uh, if we don't own the vehicle and they don't want to use an app, which we got feedback again last night that not having an app, even though we have one in development today that has future options, is they like that. They like the web page. Oh, they do. So oh. they don't want an app. Yeah, they, they oh, like that. Like you scan huh. that and it goes to a web. Like it's a web-based app, mm -hmm. right? It's an app, but it's a web page. Yeah. They don't have to download it. They don't have to install it. They don't have to open it. They liked that it was that simple versus like going to the app store, right? And getting something and downloading it, make sure it's updated and things like that. But if you get to the point where you, they just tap a credit card, then that all goes away. And it, all of that <laughs> somewhat goes away. The app has long-term value for us, but I can see like near-term if it's just payments, the web page and like setting up an account and a credit card and just being able to like plug in and charge is absolutely the way you want to go. We did get that feedback with the launch of Unit 1. I remember that specifically and I was surprised, but they liked the web, the web yeah. browser. Interesting. Version, which, yeah. Yeah. It kind of makes sense, right? You have to go to the Play Store, you have to download it, you have to make sure it's installed, mm -hmm. all like, that sort of yeah, stuff. Again, yeah, again, the least number of steps possible, right? And yeah. if you can make the initial sign up the least painful and then every step after that is just easy, that's absolutely where you want to go. And yeah. I don't, like, I, I have my wallet on me. I don't carry it with me all the time anymore. Um, mostly mm. because I'm just, like, forgetful of it or I just don't care, but... Um, if I can do Apple Pay, right, know, or whatever it is, yeah, like you would true. Google Pay. You'd rather do that than yeah. like carry your wallet with you. Mm -hmm. Screens, you got to uh, do it. Yeah, <laughs> we heard it here. Heard it here first. It's it's recorded. I, I think Hillary's yeah. in the same boat as me, though. No <laughs> screens, maybe. Just, uh, <laughs> I get worried from it's a okay reliability to, from a reliability yes. perspective yeah. and heat because. I mean, we tend to like our dark painted charger, okay? And that screen is yeah. going to be on there. It's not, it's, it'll be light silver. <laughs> yes. All anyway, right, sorry. Keep right. going. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just going to be interesting yeah. to find another, something that can. Something breakable. Mm -hmm. So yep. I think just building in redundancy. So if for some reason, which it won't, this thing does fail, it, we're not, you know, disabling a complete use of the charger. So. Yeah. 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 100%. And I'm with her on that. Like, the one reason I don't want a screen is because of reliability. If it breaks, does the system shut down? Do we overly rely on that interface for the customer to interact with the system? Because I'm not a big fan of stickers. And uh, I think Brett mentioned it the other day. He's like, by the time we're done, this thing's going to look like a NASCAR <laughs> like car. And it's, you don't, you just want it to be super simple. There's a lot of people that like stickers, Mark. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, my daughter, yeah. All yes. of us in our water bottles, right? We've yeah. got stickers on them. Computers. Um, so should we talk about Unit 2, the difference between Unit 2 and Unit 1? Yeah. What so did our we, user yeah, yeah, knows. Go ahead. Yeah. So what did we change, what's different, and why did it matter, I guess, would be? Sure. So, yeah. I, I mean, I can talk, yeah, talk from the firmware and hardware perspective. So we took the 750 kilowatt unit one and basically productized it. So what does that mean? We designed it to NEC and UL 2202 standards. So that took a lot of um, sort of backtracking and reevaluating. Does this make sense from a safety perspective? Are we covering all our bases from like electrical code and um, swapping out components as needed? And then making sure everything worked again after yeah. doing that. So. Yeah. We yeah. also added cooling. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> very good cooling systems, both for the container itself and the cable. So we are guaranteed that 750 kilowatt out to the vehicle. Every time. Yeah. Every time. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which we, there's a number of videos on that out there. We're not like, we're true 750, right? Yes. We're 750 amps, thousand volts. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there, and I, I shared one with you guys the other day, right, yep. where it's like, oh, it's a 200-kilowatt system, but it's not actually 200 kilowatts. It's uh, 
at like 400 volts, right? It's only rated for, I think, like 80 amps or something, which doesn't necessarily, or I can't remember what it is, but it doesn't come out to like whatever the rating is that they're advertising. Sorry, 200 volts, 80 amps. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're, we're doing like true 750. And the reason it matters is because you have the low voltage vehicles that draw, what, 670 amps. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have the higher powered vehicles, right, or higher voltage vehicles that draw less current but higher voltage. And we want to make sure that we meet the gamut of, like, sort of requirements across the board, mm-hmm. which we're the only company that can do that. Right. And we, we put a lot of time into those thermal calculations to ensure that this was possible. So, Can we share our max current that we've hit? How high have we hit? We've gone over 600. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then, Not 700, but... Between six yeah, and seven hundred. Yeah, it's rated for seven fifty. No, I think boosted eight hundred. The What's cable. Oh, uh, yeah, eight hundred amps out, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's that's conservative right now. We're only limited by a fuse. We're actually rated for higher than that, but yeah. From a capability standpoint. From a capability yeah. standpoint, yeah. So we've gone over six hundred. It's now it's just like we need Getting a vehicle. Getting the vehicle. Yeah, mm-hmm. we need a vehicle yeah, that yeah, can actually do it. We don't have a vehicle do. that mm-hmm. can yeah. push it all the way. Yeah. Which we're mm-hmm. trying, well, this doesn't really count, right? We're trying to find a cyber truck to plug in because no one's actually tested that Does on an NACS have a cyber truck cable they want to bring? that's not <laughs> yeah. Tesla. I yeah. feel confident that we would be able to We'll meet the that. requirements. We just want to get... It's DIN spec. Right. That's what we communicate. We just want to get somebody in there, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, the only other, the higher one, I think, is what, a Model Y... And Model 3? Those Model are the high current ones. Mm-hmm. The dual motor. And the plaid. plaid. Right? And the plaid, yeah. yeah. Which, have we tested a plaid? On I'm looking for one. You're mm-hmm. trying to find, okay. yeah, yeah, of course you're trying to find one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but okay. that's the goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, because the I think weeks. they've all pushed 700 and below, I believe, is what they're rated at, which is a ton of current to go through there. Yep. Yeah. Their low voltage system. But based off of our test data, we're at like 25, maybe 30. 35 C, C. Yeah. Mm-hmm. at those at the cable. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. That's super. It was impressive. pretty impressive during testing because you you could feel the the chill. Yeah, you could feel the when chill. It, was, it, like, gets yeah. cold. Mm-hmm. it actually mm-hmm. cold. It was getting cold. Yeah, mm-hmm. nice. Yeah, yeah. So we could freeze one if we wanted to, but <laughs> we're also so uh, unit two. And sorry, the next units that are coming out too, right? We're adding additional features to handle cold weather. Mm, right. Yeah. Correct. Heater in line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so same we'll, package. So big complaint is always stiffness of the cables and cold, which we don't mm-hmm. have to worry about that here in Arizona, but um, Montana we do. Mon- yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, Can we finish, though, on unit two? So the difference is, so this is internal, but externally, Mm -hmm. what's the user going to see that's different? Mark, do you want to tell us? Well, you want me to talk about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. tell us. Uh, What's your product? But um, so, I mean, externally, right, we we have two cables now, no need for an adapter to use NACS. So we have both an NACS or NACS, um, Tesla standard out there, and then CCS on the front of it. We've got uh, an LED indicator, right, to show the current state of it. So if it's out or maybe you're doing a firmware update or whatever it is, mm-hmm. right, it'll be red um, or it's charging, blinking, whatever that happens to be. There's an indicator there. Um, and then, of course, we have the larger QR code scanner on the front, right, just scan that. You can go to the web page, sign up if you're not already signed up. Mm-hmm. If you are, just sign up, right, and click in there. And then it has the new design, which the, the original one, we went unit one. At the time, we were trying to come up with an inexpensive way of doing sort of a very comfortable kind of cool aesthetic for it. That's why it has the wood or the, the faux wood. Yeah, mm-hmm. the slats. Sort of slats and stuff on the yep. front, but it was black. Oh, yes. And we know mm-hmm. we don't want it. Yes, we know mm-hmm. we don't want to go with black. <laughs> lots of heat. Um, mm-hmm. Lots of heat. So, it's yeah, it's a lighter color, right? I think it's like a... I can't remember the gray that Porsche Brett, crayon almost. Yeah. Oh, wow. Maybe a little lighter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is kind of nice. So it's definitely getting more towards the theme of where we'll end up when we mm-hmm. do pedestals and things like that. It fits the new theme. Yeah. And we have an illuminated logo, which yes. I think looks really epic from Higley, um, the main road. 
and you can actually see our charger now. It actually yeah. looks like yep. something is there waiting for you. So. It's in the dark of night. In the dark. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah when you're driving by. But yeah. it's not like obnoxious though, no. which is nice. It's very, it's illuminated, but it's subtle. Mm-hmm. Some places I've been to, right, it's like obnoxious green glowing. Mm-hmm. You can't actually blinking. see blinking. You can't actually see anything else yeah. um, because it's just so in your face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we are not that. We are, yeah, we're definitely. I also think about Unit Two, uh, different from Unit One, is just um, I think it's going to age well. Yeah, Yeah. I think Unit One, as we you know suspected, being out in the parking lot, we just saw the the degradation. It didn't age well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unit Two, Unit Two is really you know we're up in our game there to make sure that it's going to last. So look you, good. Yeah, unit one was a proof of concept, right? Yep. I mean, it was it was daring just to move it from the back of the facility to the front of the facility, mm-hmm. right, and make sure that it still worked. Now we're we're designed for transportation, right? We're designed for vibration. Mm-hmm. We did testing on that, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, completed all of that stuff. So now everything is really set up to be kind of just plugged in, ready to go. Kind of transport it, drop it, plug it in. That's it, right? Ready right. to turn yeah. it on, and you're ready to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's adjustable too, right? If we need to adjust it for different power inputs, because we did that at mm-hmm. headquarters, mm-hmm. Um, we'd like to avoid that. But yeah. um, but it's it's meeting sort of standard utility level inputs that we need mm-hmm. to ensure that we can deliver the power that that the customer is asking for. Yeah. Um, and I hope. I mean, we've got one. One location that's going to take delivery towards the end of the quarter yep. um, of the next units. And then we've got a number of people lined up that are looking for units. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be exciting as we start to deploy those. And, of course, we have our own locations for mm-hmm. all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, what else did we do with unit two? You mentioned cooling, active chilling, heating. Yeah. Software has been upgraded. New controller inside there. The next, well, a next generation controller. Next generation controller. I mean, I, I think, think just think like it's ready to be like for serviceability. Yeah, right. right. I was yep. thinking the productized. Like you walk in there, it's very tidy. The controls cabinet looks very, you know, the, the wires are color coded. Everything has a very specific place to be. Right. So from a from someone that's going to go in and service it, it's a very easy experience for them to do. Right. That. And then the takeaway from even unit two is. Um, just ways to design for manufacturability. So things going into the third unit are going to be a lot more modular. They should decrease our manufacturing time. Like I had mentioned earlier, we've decreased uh, component quantity, so there's just less assembly time. So there was a lot of learning even with unit two. Yeah, Yeah. we've reduced cost, both from a component Mm -hmm. standpoint, we reduced complexity. Do we have an idea of how many sort of components we've cut out of there? At least 30 to 40. Okay. In the whole unit, or was that the controls cabinet specifically? Con- controls cabinet. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I remember controls Ryan was talking only. about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Much more simple than. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just yeah. And um, that board consolidation where you took parts and put it right, on the board. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It decreased total component count by I want to say forty. Wow. Yeah. Three yeah. and four. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we'll continue to do that, right? With mm-hmm. five and six. Yeah. And continue for the rest of the year. This is all in the spirit of designing for the pedestal. So we're taking, in, we're using the containers to make incremental steps so that when we free up some resources to work on the pedestal, we have the controller ready and we just pop it in. Yeah. So mm-hmm. just straight assembly from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Unit 2 is out there. People are using it. People are they using like it. it. We're yep. getting more feedback that will mm-hmm. go into the next sort of iterations. Um, and everything that we're doing right now, to your point, whether it's technical, engineering, manufacturing, or product experience, mm-hmm. is all going into what the pedestal eventually looks like. Right. Um, yeah. And I, I like that because, I, I mean, unbiased opinion would be, most of the approaches today are take something that exists standard. You can white label it. It's got a screen button. It has a big E stop button on it that um, people push those, by the way, just for shits and giggles. I bet. Oh, yes, yeah. they do. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, instead of taking all these like sort of standardized or common solutions that aren't really focused on the customer experience, we're taking a very methodical approach to, you know, what is the customer experience the first time they plug in? What is it every other time from there? We have one customer. What is it? Four gigawatt hours? 
Oh yes, yeah. yeah. For megawatt hours, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And he's heading like, to that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. just a and it's just one yeah. customer. Right. Mm -hmm. Um that has consumed that much. And we've got others that come back and do repeats from there. So understanding sort of what's the initial experience, what's the follow on experience, and how do we do it without adding a tremendous amount of cost to the bomb, right? Complexity to the system. How do we get basic features built out? And you mentioned something else around um, how do we handle a lack of data connectivity? How do we handle, mm. like, if mm -hmm. the screen does break, how do we ensure that the system works, right? If, uh, you know, if there's some other problem, those are all the things that we're really focused on with these, is making sure that every time you plug in, it will work. Mm -hmm. What is the, a bomb? The bomb is the bill of materials. All so the parts that go in. All the parts, all the components, which we've got a few hundred parts yeah. in there, um, <laughs> to say the least. But... Um, it's the entire parts list, and we've been very methodical or very thoughtful, I think is the right term, in terms of how much goes into it, what goes into it, whether or not it's necessary, mm -hmm. um, and avoiding complexity when we get a lot of requests for new features, cool features, whatever it is. We're not, we're very focused on like things that just matter and mm -hmm. things that don't matter or, or don't have an immediate impact. We sort of push those aside. So we're not spending dollars on something that's not moving the needle. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. And I always push back on edge cases. And, and I'm the guy who says 1% matters mm -hmm. in decision making. Mm -hmm. But in some instances, 1% <laughs> doesn't necessarily matter. <laughs> the, the invested cost is greater than the return. So you want to be careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's next? Three well, and four. Three and four with yeah. the improvements and takeaways that we, you know, saw in two. Nothing. Setting up a manufacturing line. Oh, so we setting can up manufacturing. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's going to be a big one. That's so we, huge. So yeah. we announced start of production with unit two. Mm -hmm. But now it's improvements in the manufacturing. Because you guys learned a lot. Mm -hmm. We did. We did. Mm -hmm. From the first, like, production run, I guess, of unit two. Yeah, yep. everything from inventory to, you know, mm -hmm. everything down the line. It's super important. All the, yeah, yeah, getting all that stuff lined out. So, like, creating test benches for mm -hmm. subassembly validation testing. We're setting all of that up, setting up the line, training a manufacturing team. Yeah. Yeah. Tools, yep. allocation, processes, work instructions, organization, organization inventory materials management, inspections yeah. when they come in, yep. all that Incoming sort of stuff. Incoming inspection, all those yeah. things where all we have to grow things. up from an R&D facility. Yeah. To and it's it. been a really, really good experience for the engineers. Some engineers who've never gone through this before, mm -hmm. they're getting a whole new perspective of things they need to start thinking about in their design if they're good. not already. Yeah, yeah, design and not only that, but being able to communicate it to somebody else. Yeah. So how mm -hmm. do I either write the instructions down, tell it to them, yep. have an interactive session where they're, the the person going to build it is able right. to ask them questions. Design, Do you think, because go we've got a, we have a relatively young team and then we have some experienced individuals like yourselves that are there. I mean, I see it as like a benefit with the younger team because they think differently too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. They don't have that like traditional mindset of how it must be done. Um, <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm in Mark. the category, like, I'm, like, come on. Okay, all right, all right. I'm, I'm in that same category. As long as it's inclusive with you. Yeah. But yeah. I think it also, it's a learning experience for me, too, because when I'm teaching them about certain things and they ask their questions, I sometimes realize, oh, wait, maybe there is a better way to do this, or maybe that is yeah. a valid way Different to way go to about set it. it up. True. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I mean, I'm excited. We got Unit 2 out. We're going to do 3 and 4. We've got, yep. I think, 12. 12-ish currently slated for the year for our internal needs. We're starting <laughs> slow. Yeah. Um, but I think that's important, right? Uh, it's uh, We want to stay focused on building the right product, doing it methodically, making sure the customer experience is the best, mm -hmm. and then ramping up from there. Building the nodes, building a, a network that works and is reliable every single time. We don't talk much about even the back-end stuff that we do. So we talk a lot about the hardware and the physical product, all the cloud services, the health monitoring, huge. all the, yeah. Yeah. all that stuff is huge, and that's all being built in parallel so mm -hmm. we can monitor and, and you know chase issues when they do occur. We can identify those things. But also we have a picture of the entire ecosystem, and building that out is mm -hmm. going to be incredibly important. So Yeah, that team's doing a heavy lifting. Yep. Silently in the background. 
They are, yeah. yeah. And they're a small team and they're killing. Yeah, sure. All right. 